Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for join. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar on backup and disaster recovery and the key to cyber survival. I'll shortly be handing over to our presenter for today, Mark Lomas. Mark has over 20 years experience in IT, during which he's developed a passion for putting technology into real world use to create a positive impact for real people in their daily lives. Mark's diverse technical background covers cloud and on-premises infrastructure, IT management services, productivity and collaboration, as well as cybersecurity. For your information, uh, this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A tab that you can see at the top of your screen and your question will be put to Mark at the end of the session. Without further ado, I will pass over to Mark. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm just going to take over the screen share. So let me hit that button. Hopefully everybody can see that coming up on the screen. OK, so thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today to discuss an important topic for small businesses, the importance of backup in guarding against the impact of ransomware and other cyber attacks. My name is Mark Lomas. I'm a cloud pre-sales solutions architect at ProBrand, and I'll be taking you through this topic today. At the end, there's going to be a Q&A with the opportunity to ask your own questions on this topic. Just use the questions feature of the webinar controls to pop your question in, and we'll try to run through as many of them as we can. In the bottom right of the screen, I'm going to leave a QR code that you can scan. That's going to take you through to the page for our backup and disaster recovery as a service on the program website. Here you can find out more about our managed backup service, download the data sheet for the service, as well as fill out the form to request a demo if you'd like to see the service in action for yourself. But let's get on with the webinar for today uh, with a focus on the interplay between backup and cybersecurity, starting with ransomware. First, let's define ransomware. You may already be very familiar with this. Obviously, this is a, a, a topic that never goes away. Uh, obviously, a type of malware that encrypts a victim's files and demands a ransom payment in exchange for the decryption key. Unfortunately, small businesses are increasingly becoming targets of ransomware attacks with recent statistics showing that 43% of all cyber attacks in 2020 were aimed at small businesses. That's why it's critical for small business to have a backup strategy in place to protect themselves from the impact of ransomware attacks. An even more recent statistic is that, according to a recent report, cyber attacks increased by 38% in 2022 compared to 21. Of course, in any webinar where we're focusing on things like cybersecurity and protection and the reasons to build up good recovery routines, we often start by looking at a few of these kind of statistics. And we can sometimes become a bit numb to them because they get thrown around all the time. But it's still important to be mindful of how real the threat is. And it's certainly not going away. Indeed, let's get a bit more specific here by looking at just one vector of attack. Here's a quote from Gartner who noted that misused credentials and now the top technique used in breaches. Attackers are targeting Active Directory and the identity infrastructure with phenomenal success. Now, Active Directory is a technology that's still used by about 80% of organizations today, even those that have moved more toward the cloud might still have hybrid deployments in place with Active Directory in production for the on-premises side of their IT. Now, Active Directory was first released as part of Windows 2000 Server, so it's been around for quite a while. Indeed, there are plenty of customers out there whose original AD structure might have been first created way back with their first deployment of Windows 2000 Server. And that same identity management solution might still be in use for them today, having been brought forward through various migrations right through to a solution running on the latest Windows Server 2022. But it's still the same Active Directory created over 20 years ago. Now, that's not to say that there's any problem inherently with that. It's not that you're going to have any kind of corruptions in your database of Active Directory. It's not really the challenge that I'm alluding to. The challenge is ensuring that active logins are being properly reviewed and managed to ensure hackers can't exploit old accounts and stolen passwords too easily. Of course, once a hacker gains access to your systems, the chances are that ransomware is going to be a lucrative line of attack for them. The reason it's still so prevalent today is, to put simply, it works. Hackers have found this to be a lucrative approach because even if only some people pay the ransom, it's bringing in the cash. And that's what hackers are today. Criminal organizations seeking to get their hands on your money. 
To understand the importance of backup, let's start by examining how ransomware works and how it might get in. It typically enters the system through email attachments, software vulnerabilities, or by exploiting human error, such as downloading malicious software. Once a ransomware infects a system, it begins to encrypt all the victim's files, making them inaccessible to the user. The attacker then demands a ransom payment, usually in cryptocurrency, in exchange for the decryption key. The impact of ransomware on a small business can be devastating. Not only can it result in financial loss from paying the ransom or loss of productivity from the downtime, but it can also damage a company's reputation and result in legal implications. For example, in some industries such as healthcare or finance, a ransomware attack might result in fines if data privacy laws have been violated. In extreme cases, a ransomware attack could lead to bankruptcy or even closure of the business. Let's discuss some recent examples. Royal Mail were recently impacted by a, a cyber attack by Russian criminals. Ransomware affected their systems, which had a dramatic impact, impacting the systems Royal Mail used to send mail abroad. The impact was significant, with Royal Mail being unable to process international shipments for a time. This, in turn, of course, meant a significant loss of business. Another recent example involved JD Sports. In their cyber breach, systems were compromised, leaving customer data exposed, including names, addresses, and other personal information. This type of breach can lead to reputational damage and can impact customer trust. Certainly, once the dust settles, it's possible the ICO might probe deeper into whether the company had been fulfilling all its obligations to protect customer data. Now, so far, so basic, right? Many of you will already be familiar with ransomware, at least from other news sources, other webinars you'll have seen, industry advice, etc. That's why it's so vital to have robust cybersecurity protections in place. The basics like antivirus, firewalls, patch management are all still important. And today in the cloud era, we also want to consider identity management, device management and data management as part of that package of what we would consider essential security features that we deploy in IT. But as any cybersecurity expert will tell you, security is only as good as the weakest link and anywhere in the chain vulnerabilities occur. If the worst should happen, somewhere sooner or later is going to ask, can't we just restore from backup? Well, yes, well, of course, we want to be in that position where the answer to the question would be yes, where we could go ahead and execute the work to clean up the infection, remove the malware, secure against reinfection, and then restore the data to get people up and running again without paying any ransom. With the right strategy in place, you might not even need to wait until step three to give your workforce access to their data and applications again. To implement an effective backup strategy, there are a few best practices to keep in mind. First, you'll want to make sure to perform regular backups and test them to ensure that they're working properly. You should also store your backups off site or in the cloud to protect them from physical damage or theft. And finally, it's essential to create a disaster recovery plan that outlines the steps your business will take in the event of a ransomware attack. This plan should include steps such as disconnecting infected devices from the network, notifying employees, and perhaps contacting law enforcement. Now on this slide, there's various different elements. And you've got a few com uh, comments here about things like RPO and RTO, recovery point objective, recovery time objective. These are the kind of things that you might hear thrown around when we're talking about designing your backup. We'll get onto that in more detail later on, but for now, it's just important to highlight that there are quite a few things to think about when we're designing these backup strategies. Now, of course, this is all great in theory, but we're addressing our webinar today towards small business. ProBrand know the challenge for SMBs. I certainly do after working in the industry for over 20 years and with SMBs in particular. I know the resource constraints involved. Chances are you won't have the time to review all of this stuff, work up the policy documents required, do the regular testing, put in place the DR solutions, etc., etc. Even if you do happen to be a dedicated resource for IT within your business, you'll likely have significant resource constraints, both in terms of time and budget, and possibly even expertise. That, that isn't to say it's beyond the capability of SMB IT managers to deliver in this area, but it does sometimes require spe specialist knowledge to put together what one might refer to as the gold standard best practices backup and DR plan. There's a lot to think about and design with backup. And of course, we hear about things like recovery time objective and recovery point objective. These are all concepts related to the question of how much data you can afford to lose. Would a day be too much, for example? How long is it going to take to restore your data? 
what recovery point will you be restoring back to if you execute a restore? What about the server configuration? There's a couple of different ways to look at each server. One way is that the server and the data it stores and presents to users are, to a certain extent, separate. That in a restore scenario, you could just rebuild the server, drop the data back in and be fully up and running. Another way is to consider the two to be intrinsically linked, and it might depend somewhat on the application. What about databases and their respective applications? Has compromise occurred here? Of course, it doesn't matter that you might not have the resources to plan ahead or not. In the event that the worst should happen, you'll still be in that same position of wishing you did have the gold standard available to you. To go back to our response plan of before, we can clean up, we could disinfect, but can we restore? Remember, hackers are smart. They will go after as much data as they can as comprehensively as possible. And they absolutely will be seeking to ensure that you can't restore from backup. They'll be looking to encrypt not just your local data, but any network data their ransomware can get to. And that really does beg the question of whether a good enough backup can possibly compete with today's highly evolved, highly sophisticated ransomware. In one example that ProBrand had experience of helping with during the recovery stage, a customer's network was breached. The hackers got in via an old account login that had been compromised. The backup solution in place utilized NAS drives that presented simple file share based storage on the network. The hackers deleted this backup data, including a copy stored off site, which was also on a NAS appliance. The hackers then deployed their ransomware, which in turn, of course, encrypted the customer's data. A program got involved at the stage of rebuilding the customer's servers. Um, there was a bit of a happy ending here for this particular example because the backup solution that I mentioned the customer was using, the customer was actually in the process of migrating from another backup solution at the time and the hackers hadn't been able to access that. So the customers had a second source for recovery, but had they not had that, they wouldn't have been able to recover. So how do you get to the gold standard without the headache? This is where the managed backup can come into its own. Backup, quite frankly, should be a service. The days of changing tapes and taking them home in your bag are over. Indeed, you might not even be in the office every day anymore to actually do that. I don't like to dump on tape too much because well, the technology is still actually alive and kicking and being actively developed. But it's rare to see it deployed in SMB settings anymore, not just because people don't want the hassle of changing tapes, but because it doesn't provide the convenient restoration facilities people want both for individual files and data sets, right through to full DR. Sure, you might have some external network drives for backup, but remember what I said about hackers being smart. They can get to that data easily. It's just not safe. Managed backup combines three super critical factors. First, it backs up your data off-site to an environment that's out of reach of the ransomware. Second, it's a fully automated solution. Backup just happens without you needing to lift a finger. And third, it's monitored, managed and supported. You never need to ask, is the backup working? Because we're doing that for you too. Now you might be wondering just why a managed cloud backup solution is gonna be better protected. After all, in the previous example I gave of a hacked customer, they had an offsite backup too, and isn't cloud just a hosted offsite solution? Well, for starters, with program managed backup, it isn't a directly accessible SMB file share that anyone can access and modify. This essentially is putting the data in an out of reach off LAN type configuration. It won't be discoverable by hackers, won't be accessible. The location of the data is access controlled. So there's MFA protected authentication required to gain access. The solution is isolated and separate. Any malware wouldn't be able to see the storage, let alone modify it. And of course, the data center itself is secure with various security layers to control access to the environment. This is where we get to another customer example here. In this example, the customer's network was breached by a disgruntled former employee. This is sadly an all too common scenario. An employee is let go and they feel the need to hold on to some sort of grudge. And in some cases, they decide to act on that. In this particular example, the individual in question was the IT manager. As such, they had all the right passwords, including admin accounts to get in via remote access. For whatever reason, the employer hadn't acted quickly enough to disable the access that the individual had. Of course, being the IT manager, they had access to privileged logins. This included additional administrator accounts, not just a single login, but several. So upon deciding to act, they had pretty much got free run of the system to do whatever they wanted. And that included deleting not just the production data, 
but the backup data as well. They went ahead and deleted the data from the backup drives, again on a NAS appliance. It was basically blocking the customer from being able to restore in this scenario. Very difficult case, but it highlights the importance of a variety of considerations in IT, not just proper access control, even for administrators, not just proper processes to validate that former employees' access to your IT has been properly terminated, but also proper air gapping of backup data. Should backup data be within your reach, if you really want protection, your access to the backup data should, at best, be read-only. That's exactly what our backup service offers. By default, the data goes in, but can't be accessed once it's there. Now, there's no point having a backup if you can't access it, right? Because you need to be able to restore, and restore situations can actually happen quite regularly. Not just ransomware or system down, but people just losing a file, for example, and needing it back. With our service, we can either manage the restore process for you, and some customers want to work with us in that way, using us as their IT department that they can call for help, including restoring data, or we can give you read-only access to the data so that you can initiate your restores yourself. But crucially, it is read-only, so it can't be modified or meddled with, no matter how upset a former employee is or what level of access might have been obtained by a hacker. Final point to note here is, we're not going to be giving you any kind of right account login to the backup repository that we operate in the cloud for you. We feel very strongly on this point that if we're going to offer a protected backup storage, that we need to be holding those keys. We'll give you that read-only access if you need it. Never write access. That's managed by the backup agents only to put data in, and they're kept up to date by our managed services team. And before we get too focused on just having a decent backup solution, remember what I said about hackers being smart. They're sneaky too. In some cases, their access to your system can go undetected for a time. Their tools might be inside your environment, on compromised endpoint devices like a laptop being used by an employee. Their malware might be dormant on servers in your estate or inside data in your storage. This means there's an additional consideration before you start invoking things like DR or restores, and that's the detective work needed to investigate the full scope of an attack. The last thing you want is to invoke DR or activate a restore process only to discover your systems have been infected for weeks and you're simply booting back up an infected system or restoring already compromised data. If hackers have gotten into an endpoint device, have you been able to trace it comprehensively? I think this highlights the importance of considering data protection, backup and DR, and cybersecurity together in one interconnected whole. Backup isn't separate from your IT, it's part of it, taking a copy of your data and your systems. As such, in the event of a cyber incident, what level of capability is going to be available to you to trace these problems, determine the scope, and make a risk assessment of how safe your backup data might be? That risk management, that support, is that something you have as an internal capability? If you're able to validate that your backups aren't impacted, you might need to consider the invocation of DR instead of a restore whilst your on-premises systems are being rebuilt. A cyber incident might not be the same physical impact as, say, a fire, but it can knock your systems out just the same. DR is, as such, a crucial element of your backup plan. In the past, we might have sought to deploy replica hardware off-site or a hosted DR appliance that delivered a dedicated solution just for you. Today, we provide a much more flexible, fluid solution with instant access to your DR images ready to boot up. These are stored in a full data center, not just a dedicated appliance. This gives the benefit that the full resources of that data center are available at your disposal. And so you're not just limited by a pre-sized appliance that might have fit your needs at one point in time, but might now be inappropriate if your needs have grown and changed. In our solution, the data center manages the cost by storing your data on lower cost, colder hard disk type storage. But this still provides the ability to boot your servers immediately and then live migrate to higher performance solid state storage. The solution isn't simply remote either. A local virtual appliance provides robust LAN local style network access to your servers, ensuring that other local resources can properly communicate without needing to be reconfigured. And of course, you can reseed, including live data, back down to your on-premises environment when you're ready, letting you move from DR back to production operation without the need for a disruptive style fail back.
With ProBrands Managed Backup, we provide the help you need, including in an emergency, to get you back on your feet. Out of our service options ensure we're on hand any time, day or night. Our dedicated team continuously monitor the service, including backup activity and backup testing. Speaking of testing, this, in, this occurs regularly so that you can have confidence that your backups are ready to be utilized should you need them. And of course, as a cloud service, the capabilities and functions delivered evolve and improve over time. No version upgrades here. In conclusion, ransomware is a significant threat to small businesses, and it's critical to have a backup strategy in place to protect against it. By implementing best practices for backup, regularly testing your backups and creating a disaster recovery plan, you can minimize the impact of a ransomware attack and avoid paying the ransom. I again want to invite you to scan the QR code in the corner there. That's going to take you to the page on our website for backup and DR as a service, where you can download the data sheet and request a free demo. And also take a look around on the website. We can assist with various other aspects of your IT needs for other managed services, as well as cybersecurity, including helping you get your cyber essentials accreditation which we feel is a great first step for SMBs looking to protect their IT. Thank you for your time and attention today. I hope this presentation has been helpful in understanding the importance of backup in guarding against ransomware and other cyber attacks. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask during the Q&A. Lindsay. Thank you, Mark. Um, as mentioned by Mark there, if you have any questions about anything that Mark has covered or anything else regarding backup and DR, please do feel free to um, pop them in the Q&A section. Um, you'll find the link to that at the top of your page. Um, we'll give a few minutes for people to, um, to submit questions and then we will put them to Mark. So Mark, we have had a couple come in um, during your presentation. Um, mm -hmm. One of the questions that's come in um, is in the event of a ransomware attack, what would your stance be around paying the ransom? <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a common one. Obviously, I think that when people start to get to considering paying, it's usually because they've found that it might be a last resort where you know that situation has occurred. Most people do have a backup of some sorts question is have the hackers been able to get to that as well and if they have then the, the questions start to pop up oh christ should i should i pay you know i'm gonna am i gonna have to do this um I, I think it's one of those where you have to think very very carefully before you do because you know you you might find that you're actually making life worse for yourself because you could just be sending that message to the hackers that yeah they they've managed to find in you an easy target um and are you necessarily going to cease to be a target just because you've paid them. Um, you might get your data back for a time, but are they going to be able to hit you again or is someone else going to hit you? You know, it, it could put a bullseye on your head. There are other organizations and services out there that provide ways to help you uh, unlock your data for free um, by uh, working with you to decrypt your data. So before going ahead and paying, do engage law enforcement, do engage the services of the cybercrime department of the police, um, because they'll be able to signpost other resources that might provide a different route to getting your data back. And remember that, you know, even if you were to go ahead and let's say the best case scenario, you, you paid the ransom and you got access to your data back. It's not going to be the end of the story at that point. You're still going to have to spend time um, disinfecting and cleaning your system. So the end of the expense doesn't cease at the point at which you've paid the ransom. There's still going to be a lot of work to do. So I think very carefully before paying a ransom. OK, thanks, Mark. Um, another question, I think you may have touched on this within your presentation already, so it might have already been answered, but um, what is the difference or what's the main difference between backup and DR and do you need both? Um, so, I mean, historically, the difference was that when you were backing up your data, um, you're just taking a copy of the data. Um, you, you might be including the full image of a server in your backup, but you're not necessarily putting in place an actual DR plan. Um, if you're putting in place a full DR plan, then you are very definitely capturing the full image of the servers, not just the data sets. And you're probably having some sort of resource available to you that you can lean on 
so that you can actually activate a restoration of your systems somewhere else in the event that you lose your main environment. Maybe a fire or some other physical damage occurs, maybe a, a cyber attack occurs that knocks the uh, availability of your systems out. You can't use them until you've cleaned them or rebuilt. And you want to be able to activate those you know, copies of your servers and your images somewhere else. Now, that might be in an offsite location that you own with spare hardware that you've bought. Um, it might be a dedicated appliance that's hosted in a, an environment for you, or it might be DR as a service where you can um, lean on the uh, resources that are available with a managed service provider such as ProBrand to deliver backup resources for you so that you can invoke DR in the event that you need it. Um, I would generally say that, yep, you do need DR because, of course, if something were to happen, then you're going to be grateful to have it. Um, these days, many uh, managed solutions will will combine both as part of a single solution rather than you having to have two separate systems to deliver. Um, certainly, that's how ours, ours work. It's you know can deliver a, a backup and DR in one single solution, so you're not you know paying twice, uh, and you're not having to buy your own standby hardware just to sit there potentially doing nothing for long periods of time. Um, so it's much more cost effective way of uh, delivering that capability. So you know, in a nutshell, yes, I would say you do need both, but it doesn't have to be two separate systems these days. It can be delivered much more cost effectively as one unified managed service. Thank you very much. Um, we've had another good question just come in. Um, if a hacker hides multiple ransomware files in the environment, how do you know that you are restoring a clean version should we focus on trying to prevent instead of remedies? Um, I mean, I, I think that to a certain extent, um, yes, you, you do need to be looking at prevention. Prevention is always better than cure, as they say. Um, and I would absolutely um, suggest that you, you do have the relevant systems in place to um, find and scan and detect, you know, the, uh, it, to, to a certain extent, ransomware is no different from any other virus in that regard in that it's just you know you're just looking for the um malware um in your scans and in your antivirus in order to uh, to keep these things out you've got to think about predominantly the vectors of attack and how these things might get in in the first place how are they getting in um these days of course we use a whole variety of different systems you know we we we've got people working in the office we've got people working from home we've potentially got people using personal devices to access corporate resources and you've got to make sure that you've got your security in place are you going to lock down that level of access and prevent people from using personal devices where you don't have the same level of visibility and you know management of the antivirus agents or are you going to enable managed bring your own device so that people can use personal devices, but they've got um, well established BYOD processes in place to protect the access that's coming through so that we can make sure that if a person is using a personal device, that it does at least definitely have good antivirus and that it's working and up to date, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're thinking about the different vectors that people might get in. Of course, when you start thinking about all of these different vectors and you maybe go back to that previous example that I mentioned of a disgruntled employee, for example, gaining access, you know, you start to, to realize that there are multiple different vectors and you're, you're thinking about the weak links. Yes, absolutely. You want to put in all of the various protections. Um, in the event that something gets past all of that, sneaks through, you'll still be grateful to have a, a usable backup and a usable DR solution. Um, in any scenario where you are invoking DR because of a ransomware scenario or restoring data because of a ransomware scenario, you won't be considering, unfortunately, DR and, and restoration in isolation. You'll also be doing this in conjunction with um, a kind of forensic approach to ascertain how did this ransomware get in where has it been sitting and do i need to you know be be mindful of what i'm what i'm working with when i'm working with my backed up data how how long has this been infection been in my system a degree of detective work has to creep in to understand how this thing got in so yeah prevention better than cure but it's not always 100 percent. great thank you um, we have one more question, um, unless any more come in, but um, 
our final question is, can we expect that if we outsource our IT, that these best practices are in place? Is there anything we should be specifically checking that, that our IT providers are doing to protect us? Yeah, so I mean, there's um, a, a, a few different things that you can look at, including um, having uh, the relevant research with the provider to get the sort of white papers and get the case studies of how they're helping you. Um, you might want to look at the accreditations that the managed service provider holds, including any sort of cyber certifications that they have. Um, do they have, you know, all of the relevant uh, certifications in place and accreditations to show that they work in, a, in an effective manner? Um, there are various different uh, capabilities that might be available in the technology itself to provide validation of backup back to you so that you can see for yourself uh, if you need the level of transparency that the um, uh, backup has been occurring and that it's been tested and that all of these reports are coming back to you so that it's not invisible to you it doesn't become completely invisible because it's a managed service but you can have that level of reassurance you can still get that and still have the reports coming through that that you know the work is being done and that you know in the case of backup for example the testing is being done that all of these things are available um you can you can have that and we we provide that as part of our managed service as an option for you to have that um transparency through um so yeah i i, I would say look on both the uh, accreditation and certification side um, to make sure that the organization has all of these practices and processes in place and look at the technology side and say, you know, what kind of transparency and visibility and reporting will I get into my managed service if I just leave this to you? Um, those I think are the twin, twin aspects to look at. Okay, and we have had one more question come in. Um, do you think there is a disconnect between the board and IT in terms of what RTO is achievable? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I've I've worked obviously with uh, with customers for a very long time, and you know, the starting point at the outset when when you ask the question, you know, how much how much data can you afford to lose? The the first answer that will will sometimes come back will be zero. Um, and of course, there's a big difference between um, zero and, you know, a few minutes even in terms of cost. If you want to uh, have, you know, absolutely no loss of data at all uh, and be, you know, continuously protect it, protecting uh, your systems in such a manner that you have like, you know, instant failover and, and all of this kind of stuff, you know, you're, you are going to be increasing the cost of the solution. So there's a, a, a disconnect between what is... Um, you know that's what is technically possible yes but also you know is it going to be financially feasible um if money's no object then you you can have these things but often often it is <laughs> and often it is an object um and so I, I i think that a lot of people will start from the perspective of yeah i want zero but then when the when the, the quote for that rolls in it's a case of oh, okay well what about one hour you know um, <laughs> so i i think it has to be looked at from the perspective of um what what kind of investment needs to be made what, when you're looking at this um you know i i i think you have to uh, break things down a little bit because it's not just one flat homogenous thing it it's made up of all sorts of different applications and data sets and services to provide the tooling that your employees your staff your workforce need to be doing their jobs day to day and obviously within that tool set some things are going to be more critical than others if people lost access to i don't know email for a time how impactful is that going to be if people lost access to their files for a period of time, how impactful is that going to be? If people lost access to a line of business application, how impactful is that going to be? So when you start drilling down and making the assessments, you can start to make the assessments on a kind of application by application basis to figure out how critical is each one of these things? What's the what's my um, what would my RTO and RPO be on even an app by app basis? You can look at it broadly across the whole of IT, but actually if you drill down and look at it for individual applications, well, then you can start making assessments and saying, well, is my, you know, is my provision of this application architected right in the first place? You know, if you've got a critical line of business application, 
that you couldn't stand to be without for even more than five minutes. Well, just sticking that on a single server and saying job done. Well, maybe that's not enough. Do you, do you need clustering? Do you need failover? Do you need load balancing? What what level of architecture is needed around that application to make sure that it is protected? That doesn't have to be across the whole of your IT. You don't have to go to that whole expense for everything, but you can be selective depending on how critical specific applications are. And this is potentially the work that needs to be done in order to make sure that the right investments are being made in the right place. That's probably straying slightly from your question, but it all it does sort of relate back to what's possible and being able to represent that back and say, you know, what is it that you're looking for zero downtime for? Is it everything or actually is it for specific applications? And then, you know, how close can can we get to that goal? Um, without breaking the bank, what, what's a reasonable investment that we can make there in order to put those protections in place? So all of these things can be explored in an interplay between board and IT to figure out where we need to get to. Um, and, and that exploration probably has to be expanded out a little bit beyond the initial starting point. But yeah, it, it can be it can be explored and it can be worked through. Uh, we still have questions coming in, so we'll keep we'll keep going through them. Um, is the solution I'm happy to. I've got the time. It's no, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Is the solution capable of detecting data changes that can lead you to think you're under ransomware attack? Now, I'm assuming that's referring to our, our DR as a service, perhaps. Um, I think that where we would probably be more mindful to um, uh, look at um, behavioral or or, 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 um, or unusual unexpected activity in your IT environment is not from the perspective of DR but you'd probably look at this um, more from the perspective of your um, managed anti-malware services and the overall security capabilities that you're putting in place in your environment. Um, if, for example, you look towards things like the Microsoft Cloud Stack and you look at all of the capabilities and services that are available in things like Microsoft 365, um, Azure Active Directory, uh, Azure more broadly, the um, Windows Defender and the other Microsoft Defender services. There are various capabilities here that go beyond just simple signature based uh, detection and can actually start to get involved in things like looking for malicious behavior in your environment. Um, some of this is available in our managed antivirus service as well, where we can start to look to unusual or risky activity that might be occurring in your environment that might not have been detected as a explicit signature based identification of malware, but might still be considered unusual or malicious attempts to modify data and modify files in a ransomware like way um, and, in, in, and in that event, shut it down and stop it and then flag that up for someone to review and investigate. Um, so, you know, you have these processes now that are available inside modern solutions that lets you forensically analyze what happened, you know, if a risky behavior has occurred. Um, and you can then drill through that and see what happened. You know, if somebody opened an attachment that they thought was a Word document, but actually it turned out to be a macro enabled Word document and it's tried to run a script, which in turn has tried to download malware, which in turn wanted to encrypt your data. You know, it can shut these things down and stop it from happening. Um, through these behavioral based processes of, of figuring all of this stuff out. There's a lot of this kind of stuff going in in terms of risky sign ins and reviewing uh, risky user behavior and all sorts of different capabilities that are available across the board. Um, right through to, you know, in the more sophisticated side of this, things like SIEM solutions, security information and event management, where you can be pulling in all of the events and logs and data from across your entire IT environment and then having a solution like uh, Azure Sentinel, for example, a SIEM solution, analyzing all of that data um, using artificial intelligence in, in one place to sort of highlight and surface things that might be malicious activity because no one's going to have the time to run through all of these logs and all of this information manually. But if you have a seam solution in place, it can help flag these things up, highlight it to you so that a security um, uh, operator can review this information and figure out if there's anything going on that's dodgy here that needs to be shut down, any loopholes that need to be closed, etc. Um, so there are lots of things going on around various different aspects of security. 
um, that yes, can detect these kind of unusual activities, uh, even if it's not been flagged by a traditional um, signature based detection. OK, we've got one more question. We're going to make this the final question. Um, we are going to share the recording of this webinar um, probably tomorrow. Um, so if you do have any other questions after you've after the webinar, after you've reviewed it, absolutely feel free to get in touch with us by email and we'll, we'll help you out with them then. But yeah, final question for today. Um, do you need to back up if you have everything in the cloud? Um, excellent question. Depends on type, on what kind of cloud. Um, so, which I appreciate is one of those woolly answers of it depends. But let's break this down a little bit. So, software as a service style solutions. Take for example Microsoft 365, where you've got things like Exchange Online, SharePoint, and OneDrive. You're storing your email and your files in there. What you're getting from Microsoft in terms of the protection is not so much backup as what I might refer to as deletion protection. Um, so with things like Microsoft with their email and their SharePoint, if you delete a file or you delete an email, it's not deleted, deleted right away. It's still recoverable in the background. You can still get it back for a period of time. Uh, once that period of time has elapsed, then yes, it has completely expired from the system. I think it's somewhere in the region of 90 days. I think it might vary between uh, Exchange and SharePoint, but you've you've got a period of time uh, within which you can um, undelete data. Um, that's not the same as a full backup where you could define your your own expiry period. You can't extend that deleted expiry period in uh, 365. But if you have your own backup, you can start to define your own retention periods, define how frequently the data is backed up. You've got your own complete separate copy of the data. So in that regard, if that's the kind of thing that you're needing, then yes, you should still back that data up. Um, if we move more towards looking at um, hyperscaler cloud solutions like Azure, for example, well, then your data is definitely not being backed up unless you have explicitly attached a backup service within the Azure stack. You know, Microsoft have their own backup solution like Azure Backup, for example. So if you're deploying, let's say, some virtual machines, if you just deploy some virtual machines and, and don't back them up and something happens to them, don't expect to phone Microsoft and get a copy back. They, they're not doing that for you unless you've explicitly attached the Azure backup service. Same goes for many of the other Azure um, capabilities. If it's storing data, it's not automatically backed up unless you've explicitly paid Microsoft for the extra backup service as your backup. Um, so do be mindful of that when you're deploying services into things like Azure and to, into hyperscaler services. Um, you can use Microsoft's backup solution or indeed you can use any backup solution realistically that you want to um, leverage to protect your Azure data. Um, so if you're using a hyperscaler solution like Azure, and this will probably apply also to other hyperscaler cloud services like um, AWS and others, or if you're using a private cloud solution, you're using hosting, various hosting providers out there, uh, again, you know, you'll probably will still need a backup solution alongside that as well. OK, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. As mentioned, the recording of this webinar will be sent out, so please keep an eye on your inboxes for that. And with that, um, I hope everyone has a lovely day. Thank you very much.